fellow video game collectors! Welcome to the third episode of my quest for N64, where I'm trying to get a complete loose N64 collection. There are 296 US titles and I'm currently at 157 games with 139 games to go. The first two games that I have to share today come from McFly's 8-Bit Avenue, which sadly has now closed down. Number 158 is Rampage World Tour, which I paid $10.50 for. This is the second game in the Rampage series. It's an arcade game that plays similarly to the original 1986 version. Like the original game, the goal is to destroy all of the buildings in the city while also killing everything else that is trying to stop you. The more things that you destroy, the higher your score is. You also have a certain time limit to destroy all of the buildings before the town is evacuated and bombed. If you find the radioactive waste on a level and eat it, then you transform into this flying monster that does massive damage to buildings and can shoot fireballs. The game is a lot of fun and you can play it with up to two friends in the co-op mode. However, I recommend that you play the game in short bursts as it can tend to get a bit repetitive after a while as there are very few changes between each level aside from where the level is located in the world. Number 159 is Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards which I paid $15 for. This game plays similarly to previous Kirby titles. You can jump, float, suck in enemies and clone their abilities. The goal is to reach the end of each level by avoiding or killing the enemies. Instead of the traditional 2D side-scrolling of the previous Kirby games, Kirby 64 uses a 2.5D perspective where everything is rendered in 3D but you're still restricted to moving left and right or up and down on a 2D plane. The unique feature of this Kirby game is that you can combine two powers together. There are a lot of combinations that you can create with the seven different abilities available. For example, you can combine the bomb and fire powers to create a fireworks attack. Overall, it's a fairly easy game but still a lot of fun. It's also one of the better looking games for the N64 and it has these cute storybook like cutscenes. If you don't own this game you should definitely add it to your N64 collection as it's one of the best games for the console. The next three games came from Edward McKay's, one of my local game shops. Number 160 is Brunswick Circuit Pro Bowling which I paid $3 for. This is a simulator of professional bowling. It's your traditional bowling game, you aim the ball down the lane and then you have power and accuracy meters that affect how you throw your ball. Like real life bowling, it has different oil patterns that you can bowl on that also change how your ball reacts to the surface going down the lane. The game has many licensed Brunswick bowling balls. You'll find yourself needing to switch between different balls as they each perform differently. You'll use some for certain lane conditions or specific spares just like bowling in real life. There are plenty of professional bowlers that you can choose to use or you can create your own bowler, although it has some pretty limited options that you can use. It's not the most graphically appealing game, for example the background crowd is just a flat repeating image, but it does have some pretty good pin action physics. The game even has a cosmic bowling mode which is where you bowl in the dark with glow in the dark pins. Check out the game if you're interested in professional bowling. Number 161 is Blues Brothers 2000 which I paid $4 for. This game is a 3D platformer, it was initially a blockbuster exclusive title. The controls in this game are terrible. They feel delayed, which makes moving around, jumping, and attacking enemies quite difficult. The camera controls suck, and the camera doesn't follow you very well, and does this super annoying sound when you move the camera and it hits a wall. The game is very linear, it also has a silly dancing rhythm mini game that you must complete in order to continue the game. I was able to pass the mini game the first time, but I couldn't get past it the second time due to timing issues. I don't know if it was me, my TV, or just the game. There's also a lot of note collectibles, which at first seem to be pointless as they're not necessary to beat levels, but apparently you need to collect them all in order to beat the game properly. The music in the game also gets quite repetitive and annoying at times. This is not a fun or good game. You should definitely avoid it. Number 162 is Deadly Arts, which I paid $8 for. This is a fighting game, probably one of the more mediocre titles for the N64. By default, fights last only 30 seconds, which seems rather quick for a fighting game, especially when all of the characters move awfully slow. But you can change this in the settings. If both fighters are still standing and alive when the timer is up, the winner is awarded by a point score system instead of by most health remaining. Definitely unique for a fighting game. There's also a team battle and tag mode where you can swap in other characters in the middle of a fight. It's a bit awkward as it pauses the fight to do the swapping animation though. The game also has a create a fighter mode, but you have to train the fighter moves before you actually can use him or her in other modes. This can actually take quite a long time to do. 
The game suffers from some pretty bad frame rate drops, sometimes making it quite hard to play and enjoy. It does have some decent music though. This is another title to avoid, it's nothing more than a below average fighting game. So that's all I've got to show for this episode. As always, thank you for watching. If you like this, be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you have anything to say about the 5 games I showed today, then be sure to leave a comment down below. And if you're new to the series, be sure to subscribe so you can get notified of the next episode. And remember, you gotta get the power up to beat the game.